Good morning. Good morning, colleagues. Can you hear me, Lorraine? We always just do a bit of a sound check. No Perfect. Oh, wow, that's a relief. Colleagues, oh, I'm so excited to see everybody. Beautiful gaze in with her sharp, sharp ponytail. The Kyles is in. Hello. The Kyles is in from an undisclosed location. Where are you, Kyles? Where are you? This is, this is my house. Oh, gee, that's... Put, putting it lovely, I'm in between jobs. <laughs> right, so hold on. Let's just all let's all just take a breath as a family, shall we, colleagues? Right. <laughs> right. So, 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 good morning, colleagues. Welcome to Digital Office Hours and talk about bold and the beautiful. Our guests may arrive, but we really need to start with the red-headed demon this morning. So, Carlos, how are you? L let's provide an update there. Really, really good. Um, taking on board a lot of things that have happened over the last six months. Um, comments, discussions we've had in here and something actually, Lorraine, you were part of it as well about that if you can't sort of cope with the stress and the anxiety and the panic attacks, um, you leave and you go somewhere you know that you want to. So I have. Do we all and have to four weeks off in between. So, yeah, but I'm still doing marking and still actually running a course for the first time. They've Now that they know I've got some hours, the actual academic people in engineering said, come and run some courses for us. Um, but, yeah, finished up with that FM, so. Right, so, Kylie, that's, that's remarkable. And obviously, as you you and I know and our our third third friend, our favourite <laughs> physicist knows, some, some very odd things have been occurring in that particular institution that yeah. shall remain nameless. And... And look, who knew we sort of start here? But Carl's, you need predictability. Mm -hmm. you, Very much. So. If you if you live in irrationality and chaos for a length of time, I, I think it permanently leaves its fingertips on you, Carl's. Yes, I can say I've been sleeping so well. Actually, not waking up at two o'clock in the morning and laying there and ruminating on things or things that I haven't gotten to or having done two jobs for quite a while and then still getting in trouble for not doing the job. Um, yeah, it does. It, it plays on you and I still have the little palpitations every now and then, but you have to be happy with what you do. You spend so much time and so much effort and the PhDs, classic example too, you've got to be happy with what you're doing and you've got to have a reason for it. So otherwise... Okay. That's, that's amazing. Look, I'm going to go to Lorraine in a second because obviously Lorraine, like this, this is the most empowering group of humans I could ever possibly imagine. But, Kylie, I've been thinking, obviously I didn't know we'd be having this this moment, Carl, but obviously it's my father, Kevin Brabazon's 96th birthday today. Happy birthday, Kevin. Birthday, Kevin. In the People's Republic of Western Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good morning, Sophie. Um, and so, and so, it what it reminds you, Carl's, is is ninety six years. And I, he won't mind me retelling this story. He retired at sixty one. How does someone live to ninety six? Right, tough life, you know, bloody hell. And and he retired at sixty one. And for the final year of his life, and I remember this. Obviously, I was born quite, you know, but he was somewhat of an older gentleman, as was uh, my mother, an older mum. And I remember, Kyle's when he was 60, and, of course, I was impossibly young and thought he was impossibly old at 60, but um, but he used to come home from work every day and vomit and uh, crippling migraines, and he went grey. And I don't mean like grey hair and stuff. His skin went grey, and he then took his annual leave, and it was the great, you know, he'd never taken leave. He took annual leave just as he turned 61, and he took the month, and he went back to work for one day, he came home, he had a meeting with Doris, and I knew something serious was occurring. So the pair of them had a chat, put bits of paper over a dining room table, and he resigned the next day, and he never went back to work. So I think one question about how someone lives to 96 is that they stop the chaos of the capitalist workplace because it would have killed him. As I said, he went grey. So just it's a lovely sort of Kevin 96 Kylie moment. But, Lorraine, you've lived this and we've lived it with you. What would you like to say to the Kyles? Wow. Yeah, congratulations. I just know it takes so much courage to actually do it. But I think when you get that relief in your gut, when you wake up in the morning go, gee, I actually feel, you know it was the right choice. You know it's the right thing. There's, a, you know, maybe there's, grieving moments a little bit right you know and you think oh it wasn't fair you know let it all go 
it's you've made a decision today's today who knows what tomorrow will bring but you know what it would have brought if you'd have stayed there so just well done you've done this Carl. you what you've done is you've listened to your own inspirational quotes that you've been putting up and it's it's your light bulbs have gone off for you and you've gone yeah. oh, actually I'm worth more than this so and I think it's very important for everyone else you might not be in a position now that you can make that choice yes but start getting potentially things in a row. Like I think I really surprised them because when I gave notice, they were all like, oh, well, we'll let you have four weeks and you can go and reach out and find yourself a job. And I'm like, I already got one. Like who jumps without having something set up? But have start getting your ducks in a row, start thinking or have coping mechanisms. So for everyone else. Yeah. And yeah. Kylie, <laughs> one other strategy I read too that's useful that may be helpful and I think – that the rain captured that brilliantly. Whenever you have those dark moments of the soul where you think it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, surely. What the literature is recommending post-COVID with the managing the toxicity is you write the toxicity. You actually write the the reality you were in on the last day. You you write that. So when you think in six months, when things might be a bit tough somewhere else, you go, did I do the right thing? And you summon these three pages and you remind yourself as a as a linguistic photograph of what exactly you live through yeah now gay darling you were going to speak to us as well talk to us gay excited i just wanted to say to Kylie that you look lighter geez she does not she oh boy i'm actually starting a new hairstyle too i'm doing the whole do it all <laughs> so thank you gay but you've got a hair you've done your hair differently too or is it a different cut looks great Oh, looks, looks like I thought you were doing the whole pink thing. Bit of ponytail yeah. work. Oh, fantastic. No, but I tell you, Carl, you do, I mean, you look 10 years younger and you do look like the worries of the world have left your shoulders. I'm, I'm thrilled. And can I say, from my dealings with your particular institution in the last six weeks, I think that was a good move because I think that's a terminating arc. Yes. Now, Julie, I'm going to use your expertise here. Hi, Jules. Love you, mate. Love you. So excited. So excited. You are the best one in the universe. Now, Jules, obviously, you, you do a lot of professional work in this area about people making making decisions and, you know, the notion of merit and progress and career arcs and so forth. What what would you say to Kyle's, Jules? Sorry, I joined... Um, oh. now, so I'm not quite sure what oh. happened. So, so, so Kylie's quickly. left. She she's left. She's left a job. She's gone. She's gone. She had enough. She's um and she's on on her next career arc. In your research, Jules, is there material about particularly women, but obviously all humans who make a decision that you know that's enough and go in a different career arc? I remember when I've read your research in the past. There's a lot of your subjects that do this for a finite period of time and then all of a sudden change and leave and go in a different trajectory yeah, yeah. um so but it sounds like you've got another job okay well that is very lucky because sometimes you just have to leave for your own health um the, what the research says is that people leave not because they hate their job it's because who's above them their manager their board their whatever makes life so intolerable that um, they walk out, you know, literally or metaphorically. But um, it's great that you did leave, you know, with something else in mind. So, you know, but sometimes you just have to leave and it's, that is difficult. And especially if, you know, you are a major income earner, but um, well done. So, you, you, did, you know, if your gut, tell, as you say, you look, you look much happier. Um, you did the right thing and, and it it sounds like it was people above you or around you who were making making your life miserable. And but the other thing is that it has nothing to do with your performance. So that's like big, big time. And and Jules also, you and I, we haven't put this in your thesis yet, but there's also this post-pandemic movement that I've been watching very strongly, which is the quiet quitting movement. So a bunch of people that are basically at work, but they're really bloody not. And and their resistance is keep pulling in the dough and just trying to manage, but mm. just not really working at all. Mm. I'm always interested in that. And a lot of people working more than one job. I was reading this fascinating thing about, it was a bunch of men who working 
they're earning big time in their role and they're doing a similar role all working from home so that you know they're not and then a couple were caught out and but I think that life has changed it's no longer there is no loyalty you know loyalty goes two ways and I learned a long time ago there's no loyalty you know coming down so as it were um, and, and, and Julie that's what I've I mean as an incredibly old woman that that's what I've seen go over my life over the arc of my life is and you know, I've, in fact, I was saying this to my deputy vice chancellor when I was in Dili earlier this week. You know, I perhaps sadly and tragically believe in the project of higher education. I believe passionately mm. in the role of universities in the nation, in the region, and what the development of knowledge does for humanity. Right? I believe in that project. I always have. And the tragedy is, I'm I'm wrong because all the data sets and the institutions and the KPIs and the strategic plans show that I'm wrong. And, and, and the honest. despair from that, the, the despair that comes from, you know, your whole life is a lie. Your life, mm. you've lived a lie, Jules. You know, I don't think so. I think that people know integrity when they see it. And if you are out on a limb, I'm, and my husband's done that as well. You know, he stood in front of a bus for a government. And you just got to hold proud. I know the value personally of a good academic education. I went to Surrey um, University when it was tiny. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I cannot tell you what it did for me. I was a mouse before I went there and I came back roaring, you know. Um, the, just the love of education and, and the, the way to learn and the way to think and to use a library and, and nothing is cheating so long as you disclose it, you know, that kind of concept. And in my last year, we were told, do what you, you know, do your best because you're not going to fail. So who tells you that these days? You know, these I know my daughter's just, you know, it's like marks, 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 and and there's no love of learning. There's no explore, think take risks um universities have become a big business yeah yeah they're not a, a field they forget that they have students not clients and i think you absolutely you had you are a thousand percent right because you know you look at the following that you have in these kind of um um milieus and that and and you're revered and oh, I'm you not. must oh, carry no, on. Jules. No, no, no. You no. must carry on because no, we no. rely on you. I mean, oh, no. if you go. No, oh, um, Jules, Jules you're, you're lovely, but but it, it does break your heart. So I just want to sort of log because, I mean, a lot of the people in this wonderful, wonderful group, you know, it's lovely to have Sophia back. We love Sophia. And Ruth is just sort of the light of my life. A big chunk of my heart lives in Ruth's body, and Ruth knows that. Um, she is the, the when I, I wonder why we're doing this, I think of Ruth's wonderful project and I remember. But I, I think it is significant that we log so many of our colleagues and our friends are just walking with despair, Jules. And and I'm not quite sure how we how we help those crew. I think Kylie. I think Doug's great example. Do you want to say good morning, Doug? Doug's great example. He's he's sort of changing changing the universe, morning. changing Australian masculinity one man at a time. So Doug, how's your week been, brother? Yeah, it's not bad. I haven't really done much work. But I, you had the tattoo finished. Yeah, nearly finished. So it's so you can nearly see a face and and all that, but. About ninety percent done. It was very sore Friday and Saturday and Sunday, and but no, it's looking good. And um, I gave you a half-hearted, half-assed piece Wednesday to look at. So um, apologies for that. But um, no, Doug, I'm excited. Tomorrow morning, you're my first job on Saturday morning, Doug. So Doug's written me a piece on base and superstructure. So good on you, Doug. That's fantastic. And look, I look, I will, because it's lovely to have Sophia back. Sophia, I don't know if you've got stuff in the background, but we sort of see you and hope you're fantastic and we've missed you terribly. And I hope you're brilliant, Sophia, darling. Thank you. You're very kind. I'm just in a co-working space, so I'm I'm not on camera, but I am here and present. 
Oh, ter terrific, Diane. So we're thrilled to have you with us. So colleagues, we'll always start where we, we, we want to start, which is your question. So is there a, a thing or a vibe that you'd like to address? And look, I might just sort of just summon Ruth at this juncture, because I've been thinking about you, Ruth, um, and just making sure you're all right. Are there, how are you traveling post the COC? And are there any questions or things that are of interest to you, Ruth, that we could maybe play with this morning? Um, I don't think so. Not at the moment. Um, we've had a couple of really interesting digital office hours over the last month or two that have given me a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, that discussion that we had about the thesis as a monograph versus thesis by publication, I found really useful and have been really mulling that over. Um, so no, I don't have anything no. burning. I'm no, just... But yeah, no, it's funny you say that, Ruth. I saw you when that conversation was being had, particularly between Jamie and Josh. I saw your face sort of morph like clay a little bit going, oh, <laughs> oh. Um, and, of course, Liam, I saw again the impact of, of Liam saying, look, in the United Kingdom, this is a declining arc, a declining mode of doctorate, right? Um, yeah. but, so, so, But the most important thing, Ruth, is nothing is either or in the doctoral space, right? Exactly. Yeah, and so that's that's kind of what I've been just mulling over and thinking about over the last few yes. weeks. And all it is about, I think we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, Ruth, you've got this wonderful article, that's, that's brilliant, that's a great thing, and that then becomes 90% of what is a chapter. So you just basically take it, take the entire chunk, whack it in, yeah. intro, outro, done. So And that creates the smoothness that creates the great thesis as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I can really see the the value in that. Fantastic. So that's great, Ruth. So you keep percolating with that. And as I said, it, but remember, nothing in the doctoral space is this is the way. Anybody that treats doctoral education like it's an evangelical religion, you need, <laughs> you need to be worried about those people. The people go, this <laughs> is the way you do a PhD. I try and never be prescriptive. This is one way to do it. There are these other modes. These are the options, yeah? Yeah, and I'm, yeah trying to sort of because I'm very much have a plan do the plan stick to the plan so I'm really sort of trying to be a little bit more flexible um and just not exclude anything at this point um but no I'm other than that I'm, I'm pretty good Oh, that's great, Ruth. I'm thrilled. So I will just touch base with Mary too. We haven't had a great chat with Mary in a while. Now, Mary, um, how are you going? Any any big issues to talk about? But most importantly, we were doing your uh, book chapter conference gig as well. So where's that all at, Mary? Yeah, that is um, still kind of pending. I'm going to be working on the book chapters due 1st of May, and I'll be really focusing on that in the next couple of months. Um but I've been a bit busy lately because I've been getting ready for my milestone two, which is later this morning. Oh, Jesus. And I've had a lot of support from one of my supervisors on it, um, which has been very helpful. So um, I think I, I think it'll go well. <laughs> I also went to a march yesterday to commemorate the Wannerup Massacre, which is what I'm researching. So I went down and supported Bill Webb, the traditional owner down there, who's really helping me. Um, and, you know, inspired me to do this research. So I went down yesterday to speak at that march. So it's been quite a big week, but very intense and interesting. Now, now, Mary, you'll be absolutely fantastic in this milestone, absolutely legendary. How, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good because I have gone through it several times and um, we had a really good run through with one of my supervisors earlier this week with a lot of encouragement and help, which um, I haven't had before. So it's been good. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic, Mary. Brilliant, thrilled, excited. So we're all with you. And so it's in a couple of hours in the People's Republic of Western Australia. Couple yeah, of hours. 10 a.m. We got gotcha. you. We got gotcha, you, Mary. Can you just sort of let us know how it goes too? I'm very, very excited. I will too. I will. Oh. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Excited. Now, Mary, I did, obviously, we've got some requests about book chapters anyway, as you know, and the formulation of a book chapter, and I've created some little notes and bits and pieces, but I will just also just touch base with the beautiful Anvita, whose hair is out, who you know as I read as a good sign. So good good morning, Anvita. So how are you travelling, Anvita? Hi, morning. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm late. I was in another meeting, and it took me a little bit to come in, but um, it's been a really good week. It's been a really good week, had some really um, 
good conversations about all the questions that I had going forward with my supervisors. And it was fantastic. Had some made some very I don't know, difficult slash effective decisions, I think, for how we're going to manage my analysis plan, my papers, things like that coming out of my PhD. Um, and it was, it was just a really good week for conversations. So I just listed everything that I needed to ask my supervisors and all the areas of uncertainty that I had. And we went through them one by one. And it was a very, very good week communication-wise. So extremely happy. So, and Vija, I'll push you on the meta on that. You know, I've always argued that the reason relationships between students and supervisors fail is that the students have assumptions, the supervisors have assumptions, and they never shared the assumptions. So you bloody wrote down your bloody assumptions and you went down the list. So <laughs> did that create some some clarity? So would you, even though it's scary, would you recommend yeah. that to others? 100%. And I think it was, it was also really nice because... Um, I met with my three supervisors after a while. Um, I hadn't really had, we hadn't done that for, for a little bit. And I did prepare a document detailing everything that I wanted to discuss with them about, or discuss with them at the meeting. And I emailed that to them before the meeting. So I'm guessing that that might have helped as well, because then it helped, I think, my supervisors understand the topics that I wanted to discuss with them at the meeting. So maybe that helped prompt the conversation and make it easier. Yeah, look, and, and Vida, I'm a big believer in it. Doug is getting Jamie and I organised. So Doug, Doug is, he is sending agendas and, and getting us focused and so forth. And, and the gift of that is that we're not shocked by anything that happens in the meeting. So I'm I'm becoming an increasing supporter of that. And Doug has, Doug has brought that to the table because it means I'm not sort of freaked out. Right? I'm not going, oh, well, where are we now? Because, you know, I, you know, 2024 is a lot like sort of Yoko Ono's art exhibition <laughs> 1968. You've got no actual idea what's going to happen in the next five minutes. Wow, cool, interesting. So Doug creating that predictability means that there's a accountability on both sides, but also a calmness. So the idea is separated from the people. Yeah. Oh, but it's good. also, I also think that with everybody individually busy in their own teaching research personal life and we don't meet for like a month or, or two months um as the person you know as as a phd student this is what i live and breathe 24 hours a day all week long yes. like all year long but my supervisors and anybody else who's assisting giving me advice is not really doing that you know they're, they're doing other things yeah. so it's it's it was just i think it's nice to like bring everybody back to the same page and i used to do it earlier but stop doing it for a little bit. And can I just ask the 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 question that, that the entirety of the internet is interested in, did your methodology expert, did that wonderful human, was that person, were they added to the panel? No, no. So we are not adding them to the supervisory panel or the advisory board at the moment. Um, but any publications that come out of it, um, they will be named as a co-author because they have or they would have at that point in time provided methodological input into the way that study was conducted, but that's to be determined based on where we land on that particular study. Oh, so let's see. Oh, is that it's been interesting to see that in real time, Lorraine, hasn't it? Oh my god. <laughs> see, I, I I would have I would have added that person to the panel. See? So we've now got a live lab through Anvita. We watch her hair as a proxy. And we, and we see how this ends up. Fantastic. Um, and I see wonderful Susan's in. This is exciting. All our friends are in. And Professor Quinton has joined us as well. Good morning, Professor Quinton. Oh, you've missed an excitement. You might have known this with you speaking with your BFF. You know, Kylie's left the job. Oh, um, yeah, I didn't know. That. But I didn't feel it was my place to share it. Yep. You, le you learn a lot about the integrity of Professor Quinton, don't you? So you saw my face, Carl. I didn't, I actually didn't know. I wanted to wait for this morning because I wanted to tell as a team that Jamie knew. I, I actually thought it's Kylie's business, so I didn't share it. You're lovely. Oh, it's fantastic. But is, is that, doesn't she look fantastic, Jamie? Doesn't she look fantastic? Yeah, stop smiling. Stop <laughs> smiling, be as miserable as the rest of us, Kylie. Yes. Shall I say that's how my um the teams or the grounds teams that I had been managing knew? I walked out the Monday lunchtime and they were all like, 
why are you smiling so much? And that's when I told them. So, yeah. I know. It is always interesting when you resign and you're happy. I always think that's, you know what I'm saying, Lorraine, that's always a fun one, isn't it? Because people expect you to be downcast and it's like, how will you pay your mortgage and, you'll, you know, what will happen now? You've got to be as miserable as I am. And you're actually going, no, I am thrilled. I am absolutely thrilled to be leaving here. It's fascinating. Oh, it's great. It's great. So, colleagues, look, we've, we've handled some questions, but Mary's work with book chapters, and we've had a few requests, including from our fabulous Max, to talk about book chapters. So if you're comfortable, we might have a bit of a chat about that and I'll summon summon some ideas about it, but I'd really like your expertise on it because my view on book chapters is changing, Mary, uh, and I'm, I think you're an archetype of the best bit of what book chapters can be, but I think the idea... So, so this, for example, Ruth, is say you get this option in your particular field, say it's about... Indigenous issues in public health. Say that becomes a book and one of your bits or a bit of your chapter in your thesis can become a book chapter. So do you decide if you're going to do that, right? How do you make that decision? And you'd think it's a no-brainer, but I just want to go through what I think are the, the strengths of the book chapter. So the great gift, I think, of book chapters is that it can focus you on a new area. It just moves, Lorraine, your research to, to the side a little bit. So say there's a book for you, Lorraine, on post-traumatic growth. It asks that you look at your PhD in a different way and find a different refrain through it, right? So a book chapter is often something you would not have written independently. And it's a booming area. So we're seeing, you know, the handbook of series that exists in Rutledge and Sage in particular. So you write something you wouldn't normally write. The top end of town publishers, the sort of tier one publishers of books are really going heavily in this area. And it can also provide us with disciplines and deadlines, right? So an area we wouldn't normally write in, they suddenly give us a deadline. So most of you know, I just did this weird book chapter for Sage, right? They gave me six weeks to write it on mentoring that's trust me they did not get the mentoring chapter that they thought they were going to get um so we'll see how that goes blessings uh and so but but so came from nowhere was not on the whiteboard six weeks in out shake it all about got myself a book chapter that wasn't expected so that can be quite good and as mary said you know when when sort of you're trying to get it through journals with their own politics if it can nest into a book then it's a great publication arc for you. So that's great. Now, I just want to go through the weaknesses before we open this up. And this is my view that's changed in the last couple of years, right? So I used to be book chapters. Oh, my goodness me. Yes, yes, yes. Here are the problems. The first problem, and this is crucial in all disciplines, so from Jamie and engineering right the way through to the high humanities, low citations, Mary, so book chapters have low sites. So you've got to be aware of that. When you accept it, you've got to know that you're going to be crawling to get those citations and it may be invisible, right? So that's a worry and a challenge. The second thing is you almost lose control of it these days with publishers like Rutledge and Sage and Springer because they do something that I've described as the cannibalisation of the book. And most of you have seen this, say, on Google Scholar, right? So what, what the big publishers do, because it's about the coin, is they get this book and they sell the book as a book, as an e-book, as an, you know, paperback and hardback and stuff. That's great. And then the mongrels, technical phrase, chop, chop it up and then they sell each of the individual each of the individual chapters and that is a blessing for us too because you look at google scholar and suddenly there's your chapter that's in a book that's got its own little entry and its own little isn uh because they're actually selling it for 35 bucks yeah great so you just got to work out your level of comfort on that now the next one and the next two actually are just ones i want to raise because this has been a major concern that's emerged for me in the last two, three years, and it's been surprising me. And that's why I just wanted to express it, because I've always gone book chapters, yes, yeah, say yes. Here are two reasons to say no. The first is the delay in publishing. So you, you have written the damn thing. They give you this tight deadline, and you work your guts out, and you're there. And say you're needing to get another job, Kyles, or you're needing to get promoted or get your career organised to get a grant, and you need to see this publication. And you've done the work but the delays and the delays and the delays occur. 
through book publishers when it actually appears. And the delays can be years. So it doesn't matter so much for an old nana like me because I, you know, I don't desperately need the new publication today. You know, if it's a year later, my heart bleeds, knock yourself out. But for many early career researchers, they're desperate to get that first 30 publications and that's how they'll get a job. So the delay matters. And then the final story I'll tell you is, will the bloody thing actually ever be published, right? So Jamie might remember this because I was in Palmerston North when I, I wrote this book chapter and it was, what was it on? on? Oh, women and leadership and failure. So, you know, basically my, this is, that's my wheelhouse. Anything about vaginas failing, they come straight to me, Kylie. And so, so in comes this book and you know, I'm writing the last chapter of the book and, you know, that was supposedly dealing with Bloomsbury was mentioned. Oh, look, that's great. Love Bloomsbury. I'll write the final chapter. So I stopped all my other work and wrote the final chapter and, I, and then it was, and sent it to him. Cool. Then there was absolute silence for about eight months. So I thought, oh, right, well, it's gone. It's going to be published. Right. Oh, I'll see it soon. Haven't heard anything, you know, rock and roll, out it comes. Then then the editors got back many months later and said, oh, oh, Bloomsbury didn't accept it and we've gone to a developmental editor. I went, okay, right, okay. So then I get the developmental editor's comments and the developmental editor goes, this is fantastic and like put four comments on it. I love this. This is amazing. Thanks very much. So that's the, that was the developmental editor going, love it. Don't know what that cost, bless. And, and so then we're now going again to another publisher to see if it can actually be published. So, of course, I've got what is a really, really good chapter that I can't send anywhere else locked into this project and will it ever appear? So that was the error I made. Um, and, I, and looking back on it, I always think, you know, how could I help other people? What did I do wrong? And... And I'm not sure. But so therefore, that, that that was my sort of stuff on book chapters. Where would you like to go on this? Mary, would you like to bat us off um, in terms of your experience? And then we'll go to beautiful Maeve. Go your experience of the book chapter and how it's gone for you, Mary. Well, for me, it's an opportunity because um, it was an article based on my honours thesis, which nice. didn't get up after 18 months. And then I presented on it at a conference and they loved it. So it, I think I see it as the probably a good chance to actually get that research published, and because it is some information that is new and um, will change a little bit the history of the Bordeaux voyage around Australia from eighteen oh one to eighteen oh three. It adds some new information. Yes, and it is with um, an Australian publisher, so not one of those large ones, and um. I'm fairly hopeful that it'll go well. But, yeah, I actually am, because the article took so long and then it got refused, I am sort of prepared, but they might say no to that and I'll just pick it up and then I'll go somewhere else. I'll, you know, just see what happens after that. Because I have realised with ac academic articles and academic writing, that's it. People want your research, I realise that, but not... Not everyone's going to say yes straight away, and you have to keep looking for where it's going to fit in. So, didn't work for that journal. It may work for this book. If that doesn't work out, then I'll just keep looking. See now, Mary, I think that's a ripper. I think that is a great reason to use to have that as a book chapter. I think that's great. So, in other words, you, you couldn't. And of course, for those very specific you know, post-colonial, pretty edgy studies that are uncomfortable reading. Some journals are going, oh, we don't particularly want to do that. With every a book chapter is great for that because the reader will follow you. They've, they've bought the book. They're bloody interested. Let's follow Mary on this, right? So a book chapter is great for that. And again, very common, as Mary said, she was presenting in a conference and someone said, I'm compiling a book, Mary. I would love to see that what you just delivered in this book. So that's where I think, Mary, that is a great archetype of when to do this. Now, Maeve, darling, where do you want to take us, Angel? Um, I wanted to ask a question that I've kind of wanted to ask for a while. It mm. fits into what you just told us, um, and I know other people um, that you and I know where something's been a chapter and maybe it got up, maybe it didn't. Yeah. And I wondered, do you have the, excuse me. <coughs> oh, sweetheart. 
Um, I'm right. Do you have the capacity uh, as the person sending agreeing to supply that book chapter? You basically headhunted for that. Mm -hmm. um, so do, can you offer a kind of a contract when you send off the book chapter? Like, how, you mm -hmm. know, are you just sort of uh, in a lot of other things you'd have a kind of a agreement, whether it was verbal or, or written or, you know, I just wondered what are your, yeah. you know, and look, look, mate, that's a bloody great question. And again, it's me reflecting back on, you know, mole off and the scale of the the errors I've made once more. And look, the weird thing is, I, I because I assumed, you know, the Bloomberg, Bloomsbury contract was in place, they sent a contract pretty detailed, you know, one pager okay. to the contributors going, it will not go anywhere else, blah, 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 blah. You will do this, you will deliver it by this date. And of course, I went, oh, look, cool. No, that's great. It's a great opportunity. Rock and roll. Let's let's sign this up. So I've of course signed over this book chapter that is yet to appear. So so they've got me by some genital area objects, and and of course, so a fantastic piece of work is sitting there that is dating, um, and and yeah. So I, I've I've got so I I've made a mistake. I've I've signed away my power, and I've just got to wait for them to sort themselves out. Just thinking really left field because I'm not a member of the ASA Australian Association of uh, Authors, whatever mm. it is, mm. um, but couldn't we, and I mean you because I don't have any book chapters, couldn't you and Mary and whoever develop a bit of a contract which you don't sign the Bloomsbury one, mm. you send your own contract and you put a clause in it saying if it isn't used within six months, you'll resume your rights to it. Yeah, and look, I think next time, I think it's an interesting one, maybe I think you could add a codicil or a, a caveat to the the one page that the randoms are sending you and say um, if, if this is not a confirmed book within six months with an ISBN and a received contract, that it, that the rights revert to the author. And I've certainly done a lot of contracts like that where I've, I've taken bits of the book, particularly the audio book. Jamie knows we did all these negotiations where I've been dealing with the big publishers and I've said, thank you very much. I would like to withhold the audio book rights so that audio book rights remain with me. Right. And and that's been interesting because, you know, particularly Springer, they say, we're buying you, your firstborn, your mother, yeah, your mother. Yeah. every version. If I, if we want to put this on a T-shirt, we want to put this book on a T-shirt, this is our right to do that. So you know, they take everything. And I've said, look, you can have everything except there needs to be a caveat under it which says the audio books remain, audio book rights remain with the author. Yeah. And I've managed to get that through. So I think Maeve's point's a great one. Do colleagues think about that? Look, I think mostly most of us are desperate. The reason this has never been a big deal is we're all desperate, a desperate <laughs> dateless, particularly early career researchers. You need to get to 30 publications as quickly as you can. And so you put up with rubbish and you believe people. You believe people and people lie. Or people How? overstretch themselves. People think, think that things are going to end well in late yes. capitalism. So no. power, power as always. Yeah, power. But, yeah, as you've said, just get, putting in a sunset clause I, I think might be a great idea. Now, Jamie, have you got any perspective on this? Because obviously you lived through this while I was very excited and writing this. It's probably one of the best pieces of work I've ever written that no one will ever read. Uh, you got any views on this? You got any views on this, Jamie? Uh, so you want to give me, like, bring me back up to speed because oh. my attention's being diverted. No, oh no, darling. So we've just been talking about book chapters, darling, and whether or not they appear and how one would, whether it's worth it. I mean, in your disciplines, oh, worth writing. A beautiful um, Josh is not okay. here today, so you're representing yeah, sure. a whole series okay. of disciplines. Okay. So, so in the uh, the STEM disciplines, um, I think it's definitely worth writing. So, um, in terms of building your reputation and building your profile, um, articles are important. So, in the chat, I've been having a chat with Julie about. Um, her comment about people saying, oh, you should only cite articles. And I, I'm, I made the comment that you should cite things that are worth citing um, because um, it's possible that senior people will tell you, oh, you might want to cite websites and you might want to cite books and things, but your, your bibliography is stronger if you cite articles. And, and that is something that we tend to teach people in our disciplines. But if you take it to the extreme and go, if I only cite articles, I will never get into trouble, um, 
that is something that some people take away from it or it's something lost in translation along the along the way. So I'll go back and say, if you think it's worth citing, if you think you're citing something of quality that, that yeah. contributes to what you're trying to create, cite the damn thing. Yeah. Um, now, if we go back to Tara's question about book chapters, in STEM, if you want to transition from being someone who's a participant in the field to someone who people look to as an expert, books and book chapters, most people don't write those things, right? So um, that's how you get noticed on an international scale, I think. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. And that's why I was always so, Jamie brilliantly said, that's why I was always so positive about book chapters. So I, for example, got the great privilege of being asked to write the final chapter in the handbook of physical cultural studies. You know, that was the book that became the field that created a new field. So what a bloody gift is that, right? So, you, and like I, I said, I cried and I cried, Kyle was so great, cried. Um, and, you know, it's a, and the idea that, you know, I got to write the conclusion of that, that is astonishing right so that's a great example of what jamie said so here is the book that is starting a new field for god's sake say yes break break their fingers get into that book and go for it i'm, and, I'm also keen for people to get involved so i've only got a few book chapters i know um but i'm keen for people to like in our disciplines to get involved with them because um how can I get them to appreciate the amount of work that goes into a singly authored monograph that's a book if I don't get them to get involved in a book chapter? There's more work in a book chapter than there is in an article normally. Uh, not necessarily always true, but, you know, a yeah. book chapter takes a considerable amount of work. Yeah. Um, Oh, and you've got to work harder for the sites too. So if you're interested in the bloody citation index and stuff, and see book chapters are another great example that show the lie of metrics too, because people read it and are influenced by it, but may not cite it. And people are interested in citations. Let's go to Jules, because Jules' point is a great right, one. Just quickly, quickly yes, can I just go, say, um, the self-citation thing can also come up in book chapters because... People look at book chapters like they do review articles. They'll go looking at it to find the references that you provide in your book chapter. So it's also normal for people to cite their own work a lot so that people go, hey, this person's published in this space and here are the articles to go looking for the details. Look, absolutely right. So it's, a, it's and, but you, you don't want it to be a vanity project either, do you? But it's one of those things where no. because the book chapter is, is you holding your power and demonstrating your expertise, one is... Like you scaffold how you got there, but it can look a bit pretentious too. Tara knows this is one of my favourite things to say. You define, you, you're defined by what you don't say as well as what you do. So it's the same in a book chapter. Yep. Yeah, no, I agree with that. That's brilliant advice. Amazing. So Jules, talk to us about new book chapters, articles. What's going on, Jules? Um, I think that the, the thinking behind it was that articles are usually peer-reviewed, whereas a book, is not necessarily. And then the other thing which made me pause was also, and people can say what they want in the book chapter, and I thought, well, that's part of the, the pushing boundaries because often you find something where someone really speaks from the heart in a book chapter, which they are much more cautious in an article. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. In my, Go, Jules. In my field, I've found quite a lot of... Um, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Feminist Theories of Political Science, you know, and you find the big names in there and then you can reference out. But sometimes you find someone who's not that well-known and they've written something really, really interesting. Um, and Mendeley does allow you to cite, you know, a book section and that. So yeah, I'm all for it. So thank you for that, Jamie, because I, you know, sometimes the articles, as I said, are so obtuse and, you know, you wade through and you think, what a waste of time. <laughs> oh, bless um, you. But, but Jules, what I would say is book chapters are refereed. There is peer review. So the example of the Bloomsbury debacle shows that. So in other words, something went wrong. I'll never know what did. But they, but the referees went, this thing didn't hold together. And invariably with books, they go through, I found identical refereeing to journal articles, but of course they're looking for different things. They've got to guarantee there's going to be an audience. So as Julie has beautifully said there, people can be much more honest and you can stretch a bit more and the structure can be more fluid 
with the argument because the journal is not saying you must use these six headings, right? So in some ways, that's a blessing too. And as Julie said, you know, these days with all these handbooks or encyclopedias of leadership and stuff, you know, they're bloody expensive. But if you get an online version from your library, it's not a bad way to spend the first couple of months of your, your uh, candidature sitting and reading a couple of those entries a day and getting a sense of the field. I think that's brilliant, Jules. Think, and also um, who they cite gives you an idea of who the big thinkers are in that field. And that's what I found quite interesting too, because eventually you get the big names coming out. That's exactly um, right, because most yeah, of those, yeah, most of those encyclopedias or handbooks have C also, so they link to other entries, and then they ask us to list the five interesting, you know, names, big names in the field. Yeah, so it's interesting. Sorry, Jamie, go, darling. Right. Can I can I add? Um even though we live in a world where we've got these superficialized metrics of citations, don't promulgate the problem by just thinking about a citation as, oh, that person was cited. As an author, think about your responsibility about what you do with a citation. So when you cite someone's work, make it valuable, make it worthwhile. You know, if, with the book chapter, um, Julie, your comment about people publishing opinions and, and speculations and things like that, um, that's what makes research a rich environment to play in, in fact. So if you have a measure of that when you cite their work and talk about what you believe is fact and what you believe is speculation and what you believe are your facts and what you believe are your speculations, then you're actually doing a service to the person you cite when you cite them as opposed to Lovely. just superficially, I'm, I'm just mentioning this thing because I found it and it's kind of relevant. Here it goes, right? Um, I think it's worth putting that out there too. I think that's beautiful, Jamie, because there is this great legacy where, and I still, I hope I always carry that in my writing, where when I find a fantastic person, often an undecided person, I will cite them and explain why this human is legendary and why this is a significant thing to, to cite. And it might only be one citation, but people may read it and it inspires another person it's, to read that idea. One of those, yeah. It's one of those things about, you know, you know how we always ask ourselves, how can I as one person make a difference? Oh. You can make a difference to the writing culture by thinking about that and how you how you contribute to the culture that way. Yeah, and I mean, Jules, it's you remember in the old days. Obviously, I'm older than you, but remember in the old days, you just wouldn't you wouldn't see particular groups of people cited. You wouldn't see women cited. You wouldn't see people of color cited. You wouldn't see Indigenous colleagues cited. Uh, and and you know, just you think about sort of most of the world, and you know, basically Europe and North America dominated. So most of the world would never be in footnotes, and yet that was called knowledge. So there's something wonderful about opening ourselves up and and making ourselves robust in the politics of citation and ourselves accountable and making us ourselves work a bit harder and go through the citation list and go, right, well, how many people of colour are in this list? Are there any trans non-binary crew in this list, right? So where am I at on this list? So who am I citing and who am I missing out on? Sorry, Jules. No, I, I was just going to say... Um... The people who've been left out, there was, a, I think it's on conversations, there's a wonderful um, discussion with a woman who's a psychiatrist who talks about hormones and mental health. And this astonishing find, I mean, in inverted commas, is that if you actually ask people about how they're feeling and what's going on, you'll actually get an answer rather than theorizing about their situation, which I thought was quite interesting too. Isn't that amazing? Oh, my goodness. And, Jules, before we, we we finish on this particular point, I just want to touch base with Invita and Ruth about the importance of public health books as well. So one of the biggest sellers of book chapters is, of course, Springer Public Health, which we might talk about. And then I want to try and finish off today with beautiful Bree and talk about articles and the journey that Bree's going on with articles. But, Jules, I just wanted to, obviously, you and Jamie had that conversation about the importance of citing articles in a, in a thesis. Can I just state, random Dean, when I start examining, I obviously examine from the back, so I read the bibliography first, and I know we're in for a fantastic ride when I see someone's got a diversity, a multimodal bibliography. So if I just see refereed articles, I go, all right, you can use Scopus. I'm thrilled. 
But if I start to see, <laughs> thanks, Doug. If I start to see some some grey literature, if I start to see some some online videos, some vlogs, some podcasts, I start to really see a diversity of modes. Then I know this person is really thinking about information in a in a multimodal way. So actually, Jules, it's the inverse. If I just see articles, I go, all right, well, you know, they they can use Google Scholar alerts. Uh, if I if I can if I, if I can see a diversity of languages, I lose my mind. Okay, I lose my mind, and and so Mary, the capacity to um, have Nunga um, sites in place for you, uh, Nunga naming taxonomies. Uh, you know, I'm losing my mind. I'm thinking of this. I'm losing my mind. Right. So the idea that we're writing about post colonialism in English. Let's just ponder that for a moment. So the idea and the capacity that in some way we find strategies to activate capital I or capital F, First Nation, Indigenous source materials in situ and recognise the value of that multimodality in a thesis, I think is of, of gift. Have I convinced you, Jules, or am I just random? Random? Absolutely. And I'm also... Well, I'll wait to see what you say, but I'm using quite a lot of newspaper articles, yeah. Yeah. which is okay, and videos and, and little snippets and comics, and but it's fun. And I think it makes it much more interesting to read as well. Well, in some ways, Julie, you're talking about the front stage of women politicians. And it, it's not even representational politics. You are talking about how that identity is configured. And the identity of the female politician is not configured in academic articles. These newspapers and so forth, to quote our Mary, they're your primary sources, mate. They're, they're, they're the sources in and of the time that build the knowledge up. Oh, you rock. Now, Invita and Ruth, my two favourite humans in the universe. Now, you two, it, book chapters are big in public health. Um, they're big in medicine. Now, what, why do you think, I mean, it seems very antithetical, doesn't it? it seem weird because it's articles, 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 but actually the biggest sellers in Springer are public health. Why is the book chapter and the edited collection so important in, in public health and medicine, do you think, team? Oh. I might let uh, Ruth take a stab first and then I'll come. <laughs> yes, now what do you think, Ruth? Well, I wonder, is it related to what Jamie was saying, that it's, sort of a mark of status particularly when you know when you're talking about healthcare medical you know the biomedical models all of that stuff is it kind of like a status thing i wonder oh, I, don't know. I think that's good also it's a way to have international collaborations too in a different way ruth it's a good way to present i mean i'm just the three of us are working this out in real time it's a good way to present international case studies side mm. by side to to build up a new model i've seen that in all those wonderful public health springer ones that could be a yeah, thing but, um, i'm i'm glad to hear you say that you like to see a variety of literature because i've cited videos uh, from youtube that i found something useful in and I, I try not to be too precious about it and if i find the information and it seems like a good source and a valid source then yeah, Why if not? you only cite articles, you devalue nitros completely. Yeah, so nitros are a thing, mate. Make sure somewhere, Ruth, in your intro, you make a big deal. You put disco lights and lots of excitement. Speaking of disco lights and excitement, good evening, Liam. Um, Ruth, darling one, make sure you use the word nitro because, again, some of your examiners will lose their minds. If, okay. you, if you, you say you've also inc incorporated non-traditional research outputs or objects, they will lose their minds. Um, and, and you have to, the argument is, Ruth, if you're interested in democratising knowledge, which you could argue is the point of public health, I thought it was, then why would you just be getting source material from the top end of town? My whole yeah, life, life project, 100%. you know, I'm so old, Ruth, but my life project has been to create a flatter model, to flatten the model for information, to not say there's high culture up here and low culture up here. I mean, that's what my career has been based on, that this is, you know, a high quality information source because all that's about is class, the class of the person who wrote the publication. It has nothing to do with the quality of the material, but the, the categorisation of it is the class of the person that wrote it. So, so books kind of create a pseudo class because 
I don't mean singly authored monographs. I mean books that are a collection of chapters because they have all of those books tend to have a theme and the contributors are say, trying to say, I have expertise that contributes expertise to this theme and they want to be known for it. And it does do that job too, Jamie. It does It does market you as an expert. So for that physical cultural studies, no one can ever take that away from me, right? No one can ever. So th that is the handbook that started the field and Random Bird wrote the conclusion, unbelievable. I think Ruth is right on that. I do too. Ruth is always right. Ruth's always right. We'll go to Anvita and then beautiful Sophia, and I'm hoping we're going to get time for Brie, and if not, we'll make Brie the star of next week. But Anvita, darling, what's your view on, on book chapters and, and medicine and public health and dissemination? What's your view, darling? I love book chapters and public health and medicine. So my, my background is me being a dentist. That, that That's what I started off my healthcare journey with. And I solely relied on books for the longest time. And I think that the reason why books are so important in, in public health or medicine or health sciences is because it's the people who developed, I think, methodologies and, and, and theories and all of those went into book chapters or singly or singly authored journal articles. And the way things have progressed in the field of, of medicine or public health or, or healthcare as a whole, they all stem from original theories. So at some point in time, you have to go back to your textbook, right? Or that one book of or, or a sorry, a book with a collection of chapters authored by multiple people. And it, it it almost lays your groundwork for understanding knowledges and systems. So I, that's the way that, that I understood it. Well, wow, you've convinced me. So it really is a punctuation point in knowledge. I mean, books are that more generally. You know, scholarly monographs are that. They are a full stop moment. Doesn't mean there's not another sentence and a great yeah. sentence, but it is a moment where colleagues, this is where we're at. We're cool. The one thing we've got to watch is obviously that they're slow. So the publishing arc, particularly pre digitization, I think. Yeah. Springer and the small book changed everything. Emerald uh -huh. changed everything too. But they were slower, but perhaps they were more meaningful through yeah. their pace. Brilliant. Oh, and video, brilliant. So Sophia and Liam, and that might be the end. And, and Brie, we're going to have to be articles for you next week. On we go with Creative Commons. Fantastic. Sophia, darling, what were you going to say, beautiful one? So it was... Um... Just on the uh, the topic of books, we've been talking about it from the perspective of writing chapters, but I wonder um, your thoughts about actually putting your hand up to edit a collection. Um, I'm just working on a CFP now. I'm looking at uh, trying to put one together, which is a, a new experience for me. But um, I know you've talked in one of your YouTube videos about how um, I, unless you write the introduction and title it something other than introduction, then you don't kind of accrue citations on the back of editing a collection. But on the other hand, you do also potentially get some um, royalty income, which you know, we all know is not a huge amount, but um, but those are just some different factors that I'm thinking about. And I'm sorry, I know we're really short on time, but I wondered if you'd mind speaking to that a little bit. Look, I can. And even if we start this week, Sophia, and we, we finish this, this next week. So Sophia, I'm a big believer in edited collections. If you've got a big idea and a group of scholars around that idea. So when I've done edited collections and I have been the editor, I enjoy it very much. You've really got to know what you're doing. You've got to be a great writer. You've got to be a great editor. You've got to understand and developmental editing because you're taking people from all sorts of different places and you've got to make the argument from those different places come together so it is meaningful for a reader. So that is that is challenging. So you've got to know what you're doing, right? But I, I think it's great for the money. Look, what you'd get, I mean, I'll give you the actual figure. So if you are editing a book for Springer, they give you 500 euros and they, they buy your rights for that. So you get 500 euros for the job and then you, you never get any royalties from that point on. So probably probably the money's not a big deal because it's like thousands of hours and, you know, th that's your figure. But, you know, it can be great for your students. So when I've done it, so I think two of my best known in that example would be, say, Liverpool, the South Seas, which was the book on Perth's popular music. And this was my 18 PhD students at the time. It was their first publication. Most of them have gone on to professorships and all the rest of it, but they were all working in situ and together, and we produced it in four months. So that And that became the book of the field. Uh, and, you know, still, when you think about Perth popular music, you think about Australian popular music, then you see this little book, Liverpool of the South Sea, cited. 
The other example of that is city imaging, where just as we talked about with Ruth, we had a series of examples from colleagues around the world, Saudi Arabia, Brighton, Singapore, on we go, and they all enacted city imaging and it became like slices of a cake and the argument was developed. So that's a very useful thing. So I would recommend it. I think it's a, it's a great idea. Um, and I think it probably does mark your terrain as an emerging researcher. So I would absolutely do it, Sophia. And we'll, we'll return to that. We'll finish off with the legendary Liam, though. So Liam, finish us off, brother. How are you? Good evening, good sir. Hello. Sorry about my um, lateness. I'm, I've had other stuff. Um, yeah, I've got a friend who's been shortlisted for a senior lectureship. Um, and that friend needs a lot of advice on where to go next because they're being asked a lot in a very short period of time yes so can this friend have a conversation with tara at some point yes this friend can absolutely have a conversation with tara send me an email at any point i'll i'll send initial answers via email on the weekend and we'll organize a meeting shortly Super, thank you. Congratulations to that particular person, whoever they may be, Liam. Now, colleagues, I'm terribly excited. We've missed out on Brie. Now, Brie has all sorts of fabulous things to talk about, about articles and processing fees and creative commons. So let's we've done book chapters this week. Let's talk about articles next week and make it, make it Brie week and work out what your perspective is on articles and go forward from there. Are we comfortable with that? Fantastic. Kylie, congratulations. Uh, you are an amazing, inspirational human being. Every success and see many of you in Bright Club. Thank you for a beautiful morning. Love you all. See you, team. Blessings. Love you, Liam. Fantastic.